Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glenlivet Books. Understandably, over the last few weeks, we in India have kept our attention focused on the steadily declining COVID numbers. But in the United Kingdom, exactly the opposite is happening. The numbers are shooting upwards and that raises the question, is the United Kingdom heading towards a serious situation or might that just be an exaggerated conclusion? That's the key issue I shall discuss today with one of our top virologists, presently a senior research fellow at Green Templeton College at the University of Oxford, from where he joins us, Shahid Jamil. Professor Jamil, I want to talk to you primarily about the COVID situation in the United Kingdom. I see that since the 13th of October, daily cases have been increasing by over 40,000 a day. And in the last few days, They've sometimes shot up well before four, above 45,000 to almost 50. And Sajid Javed, the health secretary, says they could even touch 100,000. So let me first ask you, how serious is the situation in the United Kingdom? Well, Karan, uh, firstly, uh, good to be back on your show, uh, even though it's uh, from a little farther than I used to earlier. Um, coming to the UK, where uh, I am now and where I, I arrived in early September. If you look at the data uh, for, let's say, 23rd, which is Saturday, uh, the UK reported almost 45,000 cases and 135 deaths. Over the past seven days, this is roughly 15%, 15% more cases and about 12% more, more deaths than in the previous seven days. So this tells me that this is a growing outbreak in the UK. However, if you compare the UK's second wave, which was in January this year, uh, to the situation now, the mortality rates are down about tenfold. They were about 2% in January 2021. They are about 0.2% uh, at this time. Uh, and the same is true for people in hospitals and in ventilation support. So while the numbers are going up, the numbers of people with severe disease are not going up. So I would say that the situation is that of concern, uh, but it's not a reason to panic. Uh, and I, I say this, be, it's a matter of concern because of two reasons. Firstly, we know that 10 to 30% of those who get COVID show symptoms of long COVID. And this is something we don't fully understand yet. It also adds a burden to the healthcare system. And secondly, more infection gives more opportunity for the virus to mutate. And this increases the random chance that a variant will emerge that will evade immunity and that will spread faster. So I would say that the, it's, it's a matter of concern, but not uh, something to panic about at, at this time. But you made a very important point. Even though the increasing numbers are not going to lead to an increasing number of people with severe disease, there will be people with long COVID, which we don't fully understand. And that is a painful problem that can continue for months. And secondly, when the numbers go up, there's always a danger of the virus mutating. And that is something one wants to avoid at all costs. Those are two concerns that would worry the British authorities. Absolutely. And they should be worrying policymakers here, just as it should everywhere else. But why are the cases suddenly going up in this fairly spectacular sort of way when 79% of the eligible population is double vaccinated and pretty close to 86% is single vaccinated. And what I notice is that the cases are rising in UK in a far bigger way than they are in countries like Germany, France, and Spain. I mean, British, the British daily toll is four times more than Germany, pretty close to seven times more than France, and almost 18, 19 times more than Spain. Why this huge disparity? Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, Britain's daily output uh, is more than the combined daily output of Germany, Spain, and, and France. Uh, so there is really no simple answer to this. And 
pardon me if I go about it in a slightly long-winded way. Uh, well, firstly, UK has indeed done very well with vaccinations. And just, just like you said, all those eligible, which means anyone above the age of 12, 79% have received two doses and 86% have received one dose. For the adult population, which is 18 plus, uh, about 94% have received one dose and 87% have received two doses. And also zero surveys have shown that 93% of adults in the UK have antibodies. Now, uh, this week, last year, the UK was averaging roughly 23,000 cases per day. And now despite high vaccination rates, the rate of cases is double of that. So looking back at the winter of 2020, when uh, we approached that, UK was the, UK mainly had the alpha variant. Uh, from June this year, cases have been going up steadily. Uh, and there hasn't been any time since June this year that cases have fallen below 25,000 per day. And this is because of Delta. So the virus has changed between last winter and now, uh, despite high vaccination rates. I hear uh, what, sorry, carry on. Yeah, so uh, no, no, go ahead, because I want to say something about my experience as well, but go ahead. I notice that you're saying that it's the change in the virus from Alpha to Delta, which happens sometime in June, that is responsible for the fact that cases haven't fallen below 25,000 a day and now are averaging 45,000 a day, and the health secretary is worried they could touch 100,000. Yes, within, within Delta, how much of a concern is the new Delta lineage, AY.4.2? I noticed that it's been identified by the British authorities as a variant under investigation. Several right. newspaper reports say the British authorities believe it's probably more infectious than the original Delta, although, Everyone seems to be convinced that as of now, it's not going to lead to more serious illness. Is AY.4.2 the cause of this surge or do we not know for certain as yet? Well, we don't know that yet. See the Delta lineage A, AY4.2 or what people started initially calling Delta plus when Delta started uh, varying and Delta has varied quite a bit by now globally. This is still considered a variant under investigation because of several reasons. Firstly, uh, this lineage has two additional mutations compared to Delta. Both these mutations are outside the key area, which is the receptor binding domain. Uh, and laboratory data, as far as uh, that is concerned, till now, uh, shows very limited biological significance uh, to this. So that's the laboratory data. If you look at uh, how this is spreading in the population, uh, it is definitely spreading in the UK, but it is also spreading in 30 other countries. And travelers from those countries have been found to be positive for AY4.2 in UK. Uh, and by the way, in India, there are about 20 odd cases of AY4.2 reported as well. So it's not something that's limited to the UK. Uh, what the authorities here find is that AY4.2 is modestly increased, has a modestly increased population growth rate compared to Delta. And this may be either due to biological factors or due to epidemiological factors. Biological factors may be that a virus uh, evades immunity better or, or spreads better. Epidemiological factors may be that the virus was introduced in a population that was more vulnerable. And we're not clear at this point what had happened. And finally, uh, when you look at the average secondary attack rates, uh, secondary attack rate means I get infected, how many people do I transmit the virus to? If you look at household contacts, the secondary attack rate for the AY4.2 is about 12.4%. Uh, 
compared to delta, which is about 11, 11.1%. So it's slightly more increased. Uh, even in non-household contact, somebody we come into contact with at random, it appears to be a little higher for AY 4.2, but we're not sure by how much. Uh, so yes, to summarize this, AY 4.2 appears to be spreading a bit faster than Delta, but exactly by how much is not certain at this point. It's, its biological significance is also not very certain. And that is why it is a still not a variant of concern. It is a still a variant under investing. So just to summarize that point for the audience, because this is a variant that is now also available in India, although in very, very small numbers, as you said, just 20 or 30, it's only, we believe, moderately more infectious than Delta. And we don't know whether biologically the two new mutations are going to make it more immune to immunization, but you don't believe that is the case and no one in Britain believes that is the case. So at the moment, it's a matter of concern because numbers are growing, but not of panic and certainly not of fear. Would I have summed that up correctly? Yes, Karan, that's, that's perfect. In which case, let me ask you, Professor Jamil, the British paper, The Telegraph, hints at another reason why numbers are going up so furiously in Britain. The first being this new virus of investigation, which we've now discounted. The second reason, according to the paper, is that nearly 50% of the new cases are teenagers and children. And as you know, these are people, even if they get infected, are very, very unlikely to get serious illness. Right. Is that a reason why it's happening that so far people who haven't been vaccinated, who are very young are getting it and they are pushing up the numbers? Yes, that could very well be the case. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the growth rate of infections, uh, it is the highest among school children uh, in the grades of 7 to 11. Uh, and the next lot that comes in are children in the grades of two to six. Uh, so it's mainly children and teenagers uh, who are driving uh, the new infections. Uh, and that is largely because of low vaccination rates in these populations. If you look at children who are, well, teenagers, 18 and un to under 20 age group, the vaccination uh, rate is about 70%. Uh, children who are between the ages of 16 to under 18, uh, they have reached about 55% and that's still rising. But children who are 12 to under 15, only less than 10% of them have been uh, given the vaccine. And this is also the age group in which we see most infections here, the highest growth rate of infections. So I think that that tallies very well. Coming to your point about 4.2 earlier, uh, interestingly, when uh, Public Health England has done age-specific analysis of 4.2, they also find it to be most prevalent in 10 to 19-year-olds. And these, this is the school-going population. About 33% of AY 4.2 infections in the UK are in this age bracket. Uh, so this really tallies up uh, quite nicely. What you also said about hospital, hospital beds is true. And this is also something I said earlier that while numbers are going up, severe disease and mortality is still 10 times less now than it was in January earlier this year. And I might just emphasize the point again that this is proof that vaccines are working. Absolutely. And as you pointed out, compared to the situation in January, when 30% of NHS hospital beds were occupied by COVID-19 patients, at the moment, it's just 6%. And this right. clearly tallies with what you said earlier, that mortality at the moment is tenfold lower than it was in January. But there is one concern on the horizon, which some newspapers are speculating about as our doctors. And that's the fact that this year, Unlike last year, any surge in COVID cases is likely to coincide with a fairly substantial expected surge in flu. 
Is that a worrying combination? Yes, that is a worry. And it's a worry for two reasons. The first reason is that clinically, it is hard to distinguish between the two. And that puts additional burden on the testing and isolating system that is uh, being managed by the public health authorities. Second, more infections uh, means that more people will show up in hospitals. And that again, uh, stretches the healthcare facilities. So yes, the combination of flu and COVID coming at the same time, uh, essentially stretches healthcare facilities. Possibly for this reason, the British Medical Association, as well as the National Health Services Confederation, have both begun to publicly put pressure on the government for a stricter enforcement of regulations. And in particular, they would like to see compulsory mask wearing brought back. The government is extremely reluctant to do it. And I noticed that even the chancellor yesterday said it's not immediately on the horizon. What's your feeling? Should compulsory mask wearing be brought back? Well, I'll tell you my experience here. My experience is that uh, since mask mandates are recommended, uh, they are requested but they are not mandatory. In the open, no one wears a mask. In closed spaces, like in public transport or in shopping malls or shops, only about 25-30% people wear a mask. Uh, and I really think that uh, restrictions, some restrictions have to be in place. And what I feel is that masks should not just be recommended, but required in closed spaces, and especially on public transport. And secondly, that vaccine mandates should be brought back uh, to access uh, crowded closed spaces, such as bars or concerts. You know, everything is open uh, without any restrictions, without any mandates. You're, you're is... actually saying vaccine passports, like the Italians are enforcing, should be enforced? Right. I mean, much, much of much of Europe is doing that, uh, and that's the difference between Europe and and UK at this time. Uh, again, you know, limiting daily infections is important for the reasons that I've mentioned earlier. Absolutely, except that the problem is the Conservatives are perhaps the least likely ideologically to enforce that sort of mandate, particularly passports that are vaccine passports, they may just about enforce compulsory mask wearing in closed spaces, but vaccine passports goes against their liberal ideological grain. In which case, let me ask you this, because we're coming to the end of the UK section of this interview. How do you see the next four weeks in the United Kingdom? And add to that, what advice would you give to Indians who, because there are now travel relaxations, are looking to come to the United Kingdom? Well, uh, from what I see, I think the curve clearly shows that things are going to get worse. Uh, cases will continue to rise. But because UK has done so well with uh, vaccinations, the number of severe cases will still uh, be under control. So while hospitals will not come under huge pressure, they will come under some pressure. Uh, the numbers will keep increasing unless something is brought in to check that. Uh, so uh, what advice would I give to Indians who want to travel? Well, if you are going to be traveling to the UK, of course, you have to be fully vaccinated. Uh, without that, you can't travel. Uh, but please adhere to proper masking, especially when you go through immigration at Heathrow. Uh, I spent five hours clearing immigration at Heathrow. Uh, and, you know, in that immigration hall, there were about 800 people and there were there was no physical distancing even possible. Uh, so take all the precautions if you're traveling here, uh, especially because you'll be coming in the cold season. Let's then come at this point, but briefly, to how you view the situation in India. The seven-day average of daily cases in India 
is now limited to around 15,000, 16,000 a day. And the R number has fallen below one. It's variously put at 0 0.85, maybe even 0 0.8. How do you view the situation today? Well, India seems to be uh, in going towards an endemic phase for the last uh, maybe two or three months, three months maybe, because you know cases have been constantly falling uh, over this period. And I cautiously use the word going towards endemic. I am still not going to put my money on India having reached an endemic stage yet. Uh, because all it takes is uh, a bad variant which can overcome pre-existing immunity to start things all over again. Um, Indians have done well with vaccinations, uh, but sadly, India also had a huge second wave uh, so because of which most Indians have been exposed uh, and will continue to be protected. But they have to continue to protect uh, from further infections by masking, by avoiding crowded places. But the, important phrase, the important phrase you use, Professor Jamil, and I'm repeating is India seems to be going towards an endemic phase. We haven't reached it. We have no idea how quickly or how long it will take to reach it. But it looks as if we are moving in the direction of endemicity. Yes. And the fear on the horizon is the arrival of a new bad variant, which is more infectious and, God forbid, more dangerous. And that could set us back terribly. In that context, therefore, let me ask you, how worried are you by the fact that Anurag Agarwal has now publicly said that 20 to 30 cases of AY.4.2 have been found. He said this was roughly 0.1% of the sequencing done in India, which is very, very small. But is it a potential cause for worry because 0.1 can become 1 and it can become 10%? Or is that just an exaggerated and alarmist way of looking at it? Well, Anurag is right when he talks about about 20 uh, cases being found in India. Uh, the thing to see is uh, whether this remains as 20 cases, uh, uh, you know, next week and the week after and the week after, or are these cases growing? And if they're growing, at what rate they are growing? Uh, so that's the key thing to look at. Uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, don't be in a panic mode because something called AY 4.2, which you don't understand has come about, uh, just be careful, just be cautious. And you know the fact is that uh, Diwali is just around the corner and Diwali is a time when you know a lot of people like to meet friends and family. Uh, have a good Diwali, but don't enjoy too much of it. Uh, break it down into smaller uh, groups that you meet instead of meeting in very large groups. Absolutely. But at the moment, once again, the keynote is track what's happening to AY.4.2. We want to see whether those 20 cases grow next week or the week after or the week after that. And secondly, if they grow, at what rate are they growing? Right. But for now, be careful, be cautious, wear your mask, avoid large gatherings. Thank you very much, Professor Jameet. This is a fascinating interview. Enjoy Oxford. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you, Karan.